corpses traveling toward the sea, either the reform of medical services and the building of latrines in the living quarters, new conditions. He looked out the window at the sky, crossed with lightning flashes, and made a profound gesture of doubt. When the rain stops, he said, as long as the rain lasts, we're suspending all activities. It had not rained for three months, and there had been a drought. But when Mr. Brown announced his decision, a torrential downpour spread over the whole banana region to their families, and the banana company was suspending all activity until the rain stopped. Martial law continued with an eye to the necessities with the children. At night, after taps, they knocked doors down with their rifle butts, hauled suspects out of their beds, and took them off on trips from which there was no return. Wipe out the union leaders. The only survivor was Jose Alcadio Segundo. Good morning. Welcome back to another reading vlog, or book vlog, whatever, it's Emma. It is Sunday, but I wanted to start off the vlog today, I guess, because it is like absolutely beautiful out. It's really, really hot. Um, I'm someone who definitely doesn't deal with the heat very well. Like I'm always warm, no matter what, no matter how cold it is. So when it gets warm itself outside, I like suffer. I get like massive heat waves and yeah, anyway. That being said, it is still really, really nice out and I'm actually just about to go lay out on the lawn with my friends. They're all coming over and we're gonna kind of sit, you know, on our respective lawns because we're all neighbors, we're all best friends. Um, and we're gonna read together. Well, I'm gonna listen to an audiobook, um, obviously 100 years. I just feel so blessed that like even in this crazy time, um, I'm so fortunate that the people I'm closest with are also the people I'm in closest proximity with, like my neighbors and my best friends. Okay, I think I am gonna have to put on some sunscreen though because I burn in like five minutes. So <laughs> that's what I'm gonna do. And I'm obviously gonna be uh, finishing up hopefully today 100 years of solitude. I'm 333 pages in. I'm at the part where the, the four year reign has just ended. Um, Whew, I don't want this to be over. I don't want this to be over. Um, I think I know how this book ends, or like I do know how it ends because it has a pretty famous ending, but um, I just like, I don't want to get to that part. I don't want to get to the end of this book. Um, and like I said in my last vlog uh, that went up, it went up this morning actually, what am I saying? Um, I do want to make like a whole notebook about this and just reread it again. Um, I have like a hesitant order that I haven't put in yet, but I put Love in the Time of Cholera um, in the order by Marquez, and um, there's some other magical realism books I really want to get into, namely the the House of the Spirits, I believe. And there's a whole bunch of other magical realism books I want to get into because I adore magical realism as a genre and definitely like the deeper theory of it too. I'm very, very like invested in that as a, as a thing, which is like part of the reason why I'm craving to read Murakami so much and I'm so happy. I feel so lucky that my grandma brought back uh, After Dark by Murakami, which is on my shelf and which I think might be my next read. I also finished a book yesterday. I started this book on Friday night and I finished it Saturday morning. Um, I like read the book in like a period of five hours. It was kind of insane. It wasn't a super long book though or anything. It was a YA. It's pretty popular on booktube. That's how I heard of it. It's Truly Devious by Maureen Johnson. Um, it's like a murder mystery, which I love. I love murder mysteries. Oh, that was my mom's laugh. <laughs> um, and thrillers and everything like that. So this one was kind of classed as dark academia, like not really, it, it didn't write itself with the goal of being a dark academia book, it's just that it's set at a school and dark things happen, lots of murder, which was great. I ended up giving it three and a half stars. Um, when I start like a murder mystery book, I like I have to read it in one setting because like I hate, I just don't like not knowing things, so like I just have to finish it. Unfortunately, Truly Devious ended on a cliffhanger, which was just like such a... Ugh, it was just such a capitalist move because then you have to buy the next like two, three, four books in the series because I know it's a really long series. Um, that being said, I did really, really like it. It followed like it was also non-linear and it jumped back and forth, which I love when murder mysteries do that. And it's kind of like a generational thing. Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh. 
I have five minutes left of Truly Devious. I don't know if I'm right about the murder. I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. What? Wait, what is going on? What? Why? Why? What? No, no, don't say it can be continued, no. Um, but to explain the plot, we're following Stevie, or her name is Stephanie, and she's going to study at Ellingham Academy, which is like this super prestigious school. It's free and it like accepts students who are like super genius, super gifted, or who have like certain traits or, you know, abilities, whatever. But many years prior, Albert Ellingham, who set up the school, um, his wife Iris and his daughter Alice were kidnapped and there was a ransom demand and there was this note in the form of a riddle with like cut out letters from a magazine um, asking for huge sums of money and ransom and whatever and it was signed truly devious. Unfortunately, the crime was kind of never solved. Um, and now Stevie, who is like a crime buff, crime junkie, true crime, uh, aficionado, that's like her thing, she is at the school because she wants to solve the murder. Um, unfortunately, while she's there, things kind of start to repeat themselves, I want to say, which is cool. Love that motif. Um, so she's kind of like caught in another game, um, which may or may not be the same truly devious um, as the first murders. So. I liked it. It was cool. This wasn't actually my first Maureen Johnson book. When I was in like the prime of my young adult years, I read her other series, the Shades of London series, which I adored when I was like 13, 14, 15. Um, the first one is called The Name of the Star. It's about Jack the Ripper, but it's set in like modern day. I guess it's also kind of dark academia-ish. Um, really, really love that one. It deals with like ghosts and murder and Jack the Ripper and boarding schools. Um, yeah, I love that. I love that series. Oh my gosh, I loved it so much. I don't know if I'd like it as much if I read it now, but like really really loved it so i'm excited that i finally got to like read the first one truly devious i know the second one is like the vanishing stare or something so i will probably be reading that soon because once again i hate not knowing things and that was like my biggest problem was that the mur the mystery wasn't solved in the first book it ends on like a cliffhanger and i'm like why but I am gonna go make a snack, put on a bucket of sunscreen, and sit outside on a blanket with my friends and yell at each other from across the byway. So, let's do it.
all right hi so i was out there for two hours i think i got a little bit burned but it's fine um i feel like i might be finishing this tonight uh ooh. wow so i made it to page 356 we were honestly just talking a lot so we didn't get a lot of reading done but um my other best friend is just finishing up A Darker Shade of Magic, and we're screaming at each other about that. My other friend was reading some fan fiction, definitely screaming about that. Um, and it was just really good fun in the sun. It's like an absolutely beautiful day, and like, on these days, it just kind of feels like everything is normal. It feels like the weather is just too nice for anything not nice to be going on in the world, which is obviously a stupid thought. Also, a few people have been asking me in the comments if I had like an Amazon wish list or like a book wish list that people make, a lot of booktubers make, or a P.O. box. Um, I don't currently have a P.O. box, but I do have an Amazon like wish book wish list or whatever that I share with some of my booktube friends that uh, I exchange books back and forth with all of the time, but I've just never made it like public. I've never put it in the description box because I've just kind of feel like just shy and weird about it obviously it's kind of a it's one of those like tumultuous things I guess but um a few of you guys have been asking uh which is just so incredibly kind thank you even for the thought that you wanted to send me a book that is that melts my heart into honey thank you so much um I can definitely leave it down below if you guys even just want to have a look around for your own like recommendations or for books that like I have my eye on if like you're looking for new books to read as well don't feel like you have to please don't feel like you have to get me like absolutely anything um but yeah you guys have been asking so that is that on that let me know if like that's a that's okay with you if I leave it down there I just kind of feel like you know just a little bit like weird about it because it's kind of a weird thing but I know so many people do it so um yeah, on that note, I honestly wish I could send all of you guys a book. Uh, specifically, I wish I could send you all 100 Years of Solitude. And on that note, so many people have also been commenting that they recently picked up 100 Years of Solitude because of my last vlog or my last two vlogs or whatever, which also makes me so happy because it is a book that deserves to be picked up by everyone. Literally, it's amazing. So right now it's about... 5 30 and we're in the process of making or i'm in the process of making a vegan burger um on the barbecue which i'm really excited for because it's so good um if anyone's looking for recommendations for vegan burgers or plant-based burgers whatever um i just typically have the eves ones um that's y-v-e-s it's like the blue blue package um i've had a lot i've tried a lot I prefer, I like veggie burgers, but the one I'm having is like one that tries to like, you know, be real, uh, a real burger, whatever you want to, whatever language or terminology you want to use. I'm just having a really good day. I went and visited my grandma this morning, yelled at her from, you know, a safe distance away, and I think I'm going to finish this up tonight, and then I will talk about the other book that I started. So, yes. It's crack a -lackin. Just filming a clip, actually. Yeah, I know. I heard the camera go off. That's why I came in. Uh, you should just give them a quarantine update. How are you doing? Um, I'm doing good. You doing well? Biking. 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 It's really fun. Yeah. What are they? It's yelling? all chaos breaking out in the kitchen. No, mom's yelling about mushrooms. Oh. And dad's just in the basement. That's so weird. I thought I heard you scream a few days ago that you're passing French or are you feeling French? I'm passing okay. French now. No. With who? A 50. Mm -hmm. We were at a 49, we brought it up to a 50, so. So you're just gonna stop doing work now or what? Yeah, pretty much. Because I have two 90s, a 70, and I'm passing French. Wow. So if my marks can't go down, why would I work? You, you have know? two 90s? I have two, yeah, math and gym. So what were you filming before I walked in? Right, I was just gonna let them know some poetry recommendations that you guys actually left on my video. Or like poems you wanted me to memorize, but I just thought I would tell them back to you in case anyone wanted just random poetry recommendations. Mm, nice. Yeah, what's your favorite poem? Um, a poem I wrote last year. You wrote it? Yeah, I had Can to do it for it? grade 10 English. Oh, uh, What's I don't... it about? So, it's, um, it's like pop culture references at the time. Your guys' recommendations, The Raven by Edgar Allan Poe. That's a great one. Um... Whoever said the blue hydrangea? By oh, I found it. All right, everyone, this is Broke Boy right. by Benjamin. Broke Boy, Broke Boy laughed and teased the boys with AirPods and Gucci. The brokest boy thought nothing of it. He didn't even care about their fitties. 
The lads with Supreme were nothing to thy broke boy, for he had Uh, I know you can't. Yeah, right. you that's can't put gonna that get in. demonetized immediately. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well. This is why you don't have me read poetry. I mean, you can like block out all the bad words. That's true. Whoever said the Blue Hydrangea by Rilke? Thank you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Um, Burnt Norton, T.S. Eliot. I had part of that memorized. Um, also, Lana Del Rey has a song called. Is it called Burnt Norton? I don't know. She like recites part of it in the song. Beautiful. People recommended Emily Dickinson. Love that. Why have I never heard of any of these people? Mm, because you don't seek them out, you know? That's true. Dead people aren't gonna come out of the grave and just harass you. Oh, uh, Hope is the Thing with Feathers, specifically. Someone else said that by Emily Dickinson. That one's great. And then someone recommended a poem that I hadn't heard of which I love. It is called, On This, the 100th Anniversary of the Sinking of the Titanic, We Reconsider the Buoyancy of the Human Heart. Uh, I have since read it. Whoa. It's good. Is it? It's it good. Sound, the title sounds poetic, um, so. I forget who it's by, but it's quite a modern release, if you if you want. Um, so you should go check it out. But, um, yeah, that was basically what this whole clip was going to be. And, <laughs> sorry, one last thing. Someone also commented that they would like a video on... Um, how I annotate, or my notations, or my annotating system, or just kind of all of that jazz. So if that's something you guys want to see, I would love to do it, honestly. That would be a fun video. Um, so yeah, I think, I think that's it for now, but I'm gonna go have some dinner. Hi! Did you have a nap in the sun? <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay, yes. Okay. I'll surprise her. <laughs> Dang it! Yeah! There she is. Sorry, I was like editing my book. And I only had like my fairy lights on and like another. Oh, it's so cozy though. Oh my gosh. Okay, do it. Yeah, like if you open it, does it does it crack? Is it gonna crack? Gotta ask the important questions. Oh, does it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't know, but it's so, so beautiful. Oh my gosh. Guess with all your annotations, please. Oh my gosh, please. <gasps> Let's talk about Charles Dickens. And the goblin tears. Mm-hmm. No one uses metaphors better. I don't know. Oh my gosh. Okay, I'll answer if you answer first. We should answer at the same time. Oh my gosh. I have a great expectation for the past, like, hour. And we love the video, Dickens vs. Tolstoy, the one that we keep mentioning in our vlogs. And Emma just asked me the very hard question of, Emma asked the question. Dickens or Tolstoy? And I don't know. I don't know. I can't pick. Well, okay. We are going to pick at the same time. And then once we read more, we're going to choose again to see if our choices have changed. 
So, on the count of three, we're gonna do <laughs> our answers, okay? Okay. One, two, two three. three. Whole story. <laughs> Yeah, okay, yeah. yeah. That's okay. good. But I feel like we need to read more, though. I know. Like, it's going to change. Like, I don't know. It's hard to just, like, base it off of only two. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Watch. Like, for context, we've only read Anna Karenina and Great Expectations. Yes. So. Oh. Okay. Can... Ah, it's 1 a.m., but she always sits outside my door and cries until I let her in. I think this is going to be the last clip I have before I finish this book. So I thought maybe I would take the time to read you guys some of my favorite lines. This is a really cool part and it says, When he was alone, Jose Arcario Buendia consoled himself with the dream of the infinite rooms. He dreamed that he was getting out of bed, opening the door, and going into an identical room with the same bed with a wrought iron head, the same wicker chair, and the same small picture of the Virgin of Help on the back wall. From that room, he would go into another that was just the same, the door of which would open into another that was just the same, the door of which would open into another one just the same, and then into another exactly alike, and so on to infinity. He liked to go from room to room, as in a gallery of parallel mirrors. I really like the part with the yellow flowers too, it's like almost in the same passage, but it says, A short time later, when the carpenter was taking measurements for the coffin, through the window they saw a light rain of tiny yellow flowers falling. They fell on the town all through the night in a silent storm, and they covered the roofs and blocked the doors and smothered the animals who slept outdoors. So many flowers fell from the sky that in the morning the streets were carpeted with a compact cushion and they had to clear them away with shovels and rakes so that the funeral procession could pass by. I just love all the elements of magical realism in this book. I, I think it's fabulous. This one's a quote that like really, really got me. Um, Okay. He felt Amaranta's fingers searching across his stomach like warm and anxious little caterpillars. And then he felt the hand without the black bandage diving like a blind shellfish into the algae of his anxiety. Although they seemed to ignore what both of them knew and what each one knew that the other knew, from that night on they were yoked together in an inviolable complicity. I love this one too. This is still about Amaranta and... Aureliano. He found her in the dark bedrooms of captured towns, especially in the most abject ones, and he would make her materialize in the smell of dry blood on the bandages of the wounded, in the instantaneous terror of the danger of death at all times and in all places. He had fled from her in an attempt to wipe out her memory, not only through distance but by means of a muddled fury that his companions at arms took to be boldness, but the more her image wallowed in the dung hill of war, the more the war resembled Amaranta. That was how he suffered in exile, looking for a way of killing her with his own death. Oh my gosh. I just have so many tabs at this point for this book that like, explaining them all or taking you guys through them all would take so long. I think I would love to do like a whole video about this book. Obviously not yet because I need to gather more information, gather more knowledge, and read this book ten more times, but um, I would love to do like a very in-depth video, um, maybe explaining, reviewing, discussion, whatever on 100 Years of Solitude. This is a really great short line, but um, it's about Amaranta again. Her melancholy made the noise of a boiling pot. Wow. Okay, anyway, I'm gonna go finish this up. I'm gonna stop rambling about it, and I'll be back when I'm 100% done. Okay, so
I think the last thing I filmed was me finishing 100 Years of Solitude. There's this very big part of me right now that like d doesn't even want to talk about it. Like I feel like it's a book that I want to just be left alone in the solitude, like in the wake of this book and in the solitude that it creates while you're reading it and especially after you read it. But this is the booktube channel that I've made to talk about books, to be vocal about books, so here I am. There aren't any good words in any of the languages I know to talk about this book though. I will do my best given the circumstances, um, mainly my own inadequacy next to this guy. This is now one of my favorite books in the whole world, one of my favorite books I've ever read, um, and I can't stop talking about it, can't stop researching more into it. Um, I already have dedicated a notebook, like I said, I'm gonna stop talking about it, to to the exploration of this novel in, in more broader, more expansive, fuller terms than these little post-it flags that I have littered throughout this book. I don't know where to start. I guess some people have been asking me what this book is about, which is a good place to start. So, 100 Years of Solitude, a very bare bones, very, very, just like super simplistic structure of it. We are set in the mythical town of Macondo. Doesn't exist in real life. That doesn't matter. Um, and we are following the evolution and kind of dissolution of this town through the eyes of the Buendia family, starting with Jose Arcadio Buendia and his wife Ursula. The opening line of this book is a really good place to start. I mean, that's where you usually start when you read a book, Emma. But um, I mean that because it just, first of all, it shows off Marquez's genius. It shows off the insane um, playing around and playfulness and treating of time as like a, a malleable object or a ball and like the, the kind of framework that this book ultimately leads you to realize that it is built with. I don't know what I'm saying. It is an extremely short first sentence, but here it is. Many years later. As he faced the firing squad, Colonel Aureliano Buendia was to remember that distant afternoon when his father took him to discover ice. I'm sorry I kind of read that first sentence like that, but it just I just like the breakdown of everything that is going on in the very first sentence of this book is insane. Many years later, he remembered a distant afternoon. His father took to discover ice. Every single sentence, I promise you, in this book is exactly like that. Marquez wastes nothing. Everything that he writes is like, you could write an essay on it. Every single one of the sentences in this book could be a huge book of its own, which is crazy. Uh, the other thing I do want to kind of say, I guess, if anyone is looking to pick up this book, if anyone um, who doesn't know about this book and you want to get into it because I keep raving about it, I do want to say it, it is, objectively, it is a very difficult book to read. Like, this is probably one of the most difficult books I've ever read for a number of reasons. One of the most technical reasons was just because our main characters, first of all, there are this many, but second of all, they all have the same names. They're all named the same thing. There are so many people named the same name in this book because the family just keeps repeating itself, kind of birthing out itself, giving birth to the same things over and over again, and they keep repeating their mistakes, and they keep letting themselves live in this like circular piece of time that just keeps going on and on and revolution after revolution, both in terms of war and in terms of uh, repetition is insane. So here is our cast of characters. Not all of them, obviously, but this is just the Buendia family. Every one of these people, super important. Every one of them does huge, important, major things, most of which have been done previously because, like I said, this book is just a huge repetition, revolution. Um, the word solitude and the word solitary or aloneness or s lonesome, anything with the word solitude appears on almost every single page of this book. It's insane. So I do want to say that as well. Like, I have by no means scratched the surface with this book. I feel like obviously I got so much out of it, but obviously I don't understand everything in it, which of course happens with every single book. You're never going to perfectly, you're never going to have perfect meaning endowed upon you, but I'm just saying that this was objectively a very difficult text to work with. Um, but such a rewarding one, guys, such a rewarding one. I finished this, as you saw this afternoon, and I, whew, I felt like I was just blown away. 
blown away is a really good word if you've read this book you'll know more than just like the magical realism and everything like that the huge huge just like chunks of history that marquez takes and rewrites and subverts and finally tells in his own words while also using magical realism like as a way to express those histories and those pasts. Condo is loosely inspired um, from the town where Marquez grew up in northern Colombia. I have since um, listened to a whole bunch of um, videos about 100 Years of Solitude and whatever else I could get my ears on because unfortunately I can't read a lot right now still with my concussion but I'm trying to do as much good research as I can with what I have. One of the huge events in this book is obviously war and uh, Colonel Aureliano Buendia who is the first character we have mentioned in this book on the first sentence of the first page um, he famously fights 32 wars um, it tells a lot of the history between the conservatives and the liberals and war-torn Colombia during that time. It also really tragically details the neo-colonialism that takes place, uh, in this case through the eyes of Macondo and through the eyes of the Buendia family. There's this one part in here, um, and also like I said, I will do a whole video about this book at some point, like I know it's gonna be on my channel at some point in time, but um, to talk about like neo-colonialism a little bit, it differs from colonialism in that a neo-colonialism or new colonialism, it is now business enterprises, business companies, business entities who are the ones doing kind of the colonializing from far away, who are exploiting these countries or these nations or these peoples or these towns um, in order to participate in their business ventures. One of the other huge differences, there's many more, but one that's I guess important um, in terms of what I want to talk about right now, is that in neocolonialism there is no annexation of territory to the colonizers, the people who inhabit these lands, keep their lands, um, but that's just really hard because even as I'm saying that I'm like realistically, logically thinking do they really keep them if the people who originally live on these lands, for example the people who live in Macondo, are then used to exploit their own lands because they are being exploited by these business entities. Can you really realistically say that they keep their land when they have to treat it the way they treat it in order to survive kind of thing. I don't know. What I am talking about, in any case, is the 1928 Banana Massacre. This is something that is hugely touched on and rewritten in Marquez's book that I have here in my hand. When he was six years old, he witnessed um, this event or he heard about it. I'm not sure if he was there. I'm not 100% sure of the way that he was acquainted with this event or how closely, but it was obviously a huge part of his history and his upbringing and everything like that. So, um, basically in Macondo, this banana company, <laughs> the banana company, uh, comes and exploits all of the workers and the people. And in Colombia in 1928, the same thing happened. The workers went on strike from um, the town and they all gathered together because they thought that the people from this American company were going to listen to them and were going to, you know, try to negotiate or solve some of these problems. Unfortunately, what ended up happening was that they got the Colombian government to open fire on these workers and they killed so many people. Um, that is a huge event in this book and one of the saddest things ever is that there is a six-year-old boy in 100 years of solitude. He's one of the two survivors of this massacre and he witnesses it um, just as Mark has witnessed it and years later in 100 years of solitude the six-year-old boy is known as that crazy old man who talks about the banana massacre because if you don't know this event was pretty much written out of Colombian history or tried to be written out by the banana company um, because obviously they didn't want anyone to know that this violence, this massacre had gone down and Marquez himself kind of becomes that crazy old man who goes about raving about the murder of these people and the massacre and the violence and it's just like it really got me. So heartbreaking. So awful. That's one of the things that goes on here. There's a million trillion bajillion things in this book, all with the capacity to break your heart, so there is that as well. Uh, obviously there's so much more I want to talk about because the banana massacre takes place in only the span of like 20 or 50 pages out of this like 417 page book, so. Once again, I think this vlog is getting really, really long. I might upload two vlogs a week again because I just, <laughs> they get way too long and then it gets too crazy and then my, my computer wants to explode when it tries exporting the footage. <laughs> yeah, there's just so much more I want to say. In the end though, I guess what I truly want to say is that this 
book changed my life. Um, the time I spent in this book, the solitariness and the solitude with which it kind of washed over me with was incredible, amazing. Uh, I know I'm going to read this book again and again and again. I feel, it feels really, really cool that I'm somehow in a place in my life where like I have a YouTube channel and I have an excuse to film myself talking about my first experience with a book that I know is going to be with me for the rest of the time that I exist on this planet. It feels very refreshing in a sense that I feel very young. That's not a good word, but I feel very just kind of so new. It feels like spring reading this book right now after I finished it and it is spring. My understanding and my love of this book is only starting to bloom for the first time right now is only coming in into season and into bud and whatever else because there's so much I can do with this book so many places I want to let it take me um, I am so <sighs> this was just absolutely incredible you guys absolutely incredible uh, in terms of the rest of the plot, yeah, like I said, we just follow the Buendia family, that huge cast of characters, what they get up to, what they do, their loves, their tragedies, their sadness, their participation, and their existence um, in in this war, and in this neocolonialism, and um, everything like that. It was it, incredible. As you can see, it's absolutely just stuffed full of annotations at this point. Um, I would like to go over a lot of them more thoroughly because there's just so many and all of them are so important and um, <laughs> yeah. Do, do, do tell me if you guys would like a whole video about this book because I mean I'm probably gonna do it anyway but like if you wanna see it tell me or like tell me what like you would like out of it because I've never done a video dedicated to one soul book. I've never done a book review video where I just talked about one single novel or anything like that. All right my memory card just got too full but um yeah like I was saying I think I have a few ideas about how I'd like to structure and create a video like that and I by no means am like if endowed with any ability to talk um to any degree of completeness about 100 Years of Solitude, but just from like my perspective, what I got out of it, which obviously pales in comparison to what, you know, like, to what obviously the momentous, just everything that Columbia celebrates this book for, which I know I can never appreciate to 100%, much less 90%, but it is quite a difficult book, and I think if I did make a video like that, like, it would even deepen, it would even serve to deepen my own understanding and my own enjoyment and my own just kind of personal journey with this book. I don't know, um, but if you guys would like anything like that, like, just, just let me know. So, um, five stars, clearly, and, um, one on my favorite shelf on Goodreads. Which was insane. I also picked up another book. I'm now 36 pages through. I'm trying to read this one with my own eyes. <laughs> um, and it is Stories of God by Rilke. This is one of the only works of Rilke that I haven't yet read. I've read quite a few. You guys know he's my favorite poet, probably my favorite person who's ever laid pen to paper. Um, I'm in love with him. I'm obsessed. He wrote Stories of God, which is a collection of 13 short stories when he was 23. Uh, he wrote it either... was he in Russia when he wrote it? I'm not sure if he was in Russia, technically, but he wrote it after his... one of his trips to Russia, which was always this kind of, like, place of just mystery to him, and he was so inspired by the kind of humble spirituality and kind of everyday mundane magical spiritualism um, of, of God that he saw in the people of Russia that he decided to write these 13 short stories which are actually kind of written for children. Um, Rilke had this thing where he's like very shy about talking to children. He thought that they were like the most important people on the planet and he would get too embarrassed to talk to them directly so he wrote stories for them so that he wouldn't have to talk to them but that his stories could talk to them. I just think that's so cute. Very Rilke. He's just a small bean. But um, these stories are just like very, very interesting. Very cool. I said before that Rilke's take on spirituality and Rilke's take on God and that 
his, mm, I don't know, I don't want to say architecture because he kind of thrashes and takes down that architecture of like the church and these structures that people insert God into and he's just like, no, like it's everywhere, it's, it's bigger. I don't really know, I'm not saying this well, I need to do more research. I'm on, what am I on right now? I'm on the second story, which is called The Stranger. Rilke's use of German is also very interesting. I've read a lot of, like, um, translators' thoughts on him and their experience in translating Rilke from German to English. They say that he uses a very quirky, very inventive, kind of strange German. Sometimes he makes up words, which is obviously a lot easier to do in German than in English. Um, and you can kind of just compound things together endlessly in the German language, whereas English English, we just unfortunately don't have that because the English language sucks. But this one was just a really cute little passage. It's not like the most momentous thing ever. I just think it's a really like simplistic sweetness, but do you still remember God? The stranger reflected. His eyes looked deep into the dark and with the little points of light in the pupils, they resembled two long arbored walks in a park over which summer and sun lie luminous and broad. These two began so with round twilight, stretching an ever-narrowing obscurity back to a distant shimmering point, the exit on the far side into a perhaps much brighter day. What's like interesting with Rilke too, besides the point that I'm just absolutely in love with him, is that, uh, I don't know, it's not really, I don't want to call it magical realism, it's not, it's definitely not, I don't know why I even said that, but it's just like the way I, I'm trying to explain it, it, it takes a little bit of like work because it is connected to spirituality definitely and it's connected to this idea of god and this pursuit of what is kind of after life or what is occurring at the same time as life but you can't see it i don't want to say parallel worlds that sounds wrong that sounds like science fictiony or even magical realism -y. but it i don't know there's just like certain parallels to use the word that way that i find between like murakami or other writers of magical realism but really murakami i think when i get at it certain parts of um his work really reminds me of rilke specifically rilke's book of hours which is a book of poetry also called love poems to god that is one of my favorite works of his that's what also one of my favorite works of all time the book of hours um it's phenomenal but there's like certain parts where like Rilke will hint and he kind of did in that passage in The Stranger he kind of hints at this like veil that is always in front of every object in front of every texture in front of every kind of atom of our perceivable world but it's kind of a veil that at certain times you can shift away and suddenly there's like this whole interiority uh, that explodes into exteriority that like I, this is so hard to explain but it's this very specific feeling that I've only ever encountered in Rilke and a little bit in Murakami specifically in the wind up bird chronicle if anyone has read that mostly one of the main things I also want to say is that like that veil the separation there is one that is definitely in a relationship with spirituality and with a pursuit and with a finding of God the relationship that Rilke has with this with his um, with his perspective and with his experience with God is such a unique, interesting one. Um, for example, he, I think he's my, he might be the first person who ever writes down the thought that asks, what will you do, God, when I die? Like, what will you do kind of thing? And it's just very interesting. But besides the point, that like masking away or peeling away of that layer, that veil, to get at the things unseen is very interesting and to do so through like spirituality or like whatever you want to call it and i find it such an interesting topic of research and these stories about god are so interesting already a little bit i've seen in the stranger the first story is called the hands of god and it's just so interesting because Rilke definitely has this like relationship and his spirituality is something that is so distinct about him but so hard to explain and he's not really concerned with like what the very upright or very kind of traditional views are in the first story he even says that God almost died and it's just this very like not humanizing necessarily but it just kind of brings he like brings it down to you. He brings heaven down here and it's very cool, very interesting. These aren't fully formed thoughts. This is just me rambling. Obviously, I'm just kind of saying what I think based on what I've read and what I've experienced in my life, but 
those are my thoughts on stories got so far if you can't tell really liking it <laughs> um anyway i think i'm gonna go read this for a bit i also have a new audiobook in since i finished 100 years of solitude that i'll talk about in a little bit um this clip has been stupidly long i'm sorry hope you had a snack or some tea or something i myself am having some peppermint tea so um i will talk to you soon